networks, C-SPAN Radio, and a video-rich website, cspan.org. According to a recent government report, thousands of weapons for security forces in Afghanistan are at risk of being stolen. Lawmakers heard testimony about efforts to train and equip Afghan security forces during this House Oversight Subcommittee hearing. This lasts about an hour, 40 minutes. Good morning, everybody. A quorum being present of the Subcommittee on National Security and Foreign Affairs hearing entitled Training and Equipping Afghan Security Forces Unaccounted Weapons and Strategic Challenges will come to order. Uh, I want to acknowledge our new ranking member, Mr. Jeff Flake from Arizona, and congratulate him. We continue to look forward to working with you. We appreciate also his cooperation, the staff's cooperation, putting together the uh, oversight plan for the 111th Congress, which uh, was accepted on Tuesday. Uh, it's also been our experience in the past uh, that all of these uh, good witnesses today and their organizations have been very helpful to Congress as we try to do our oversight function. Uh, GAO and, and the IG's office have uh, always done uh, a tremendous job in helping us perform our duties and also independent uh, non-governmental agencies like Mr. Schneider's have been uh, very effective and we've uh, worked with them on many occasions. So we want to thank each of our uh, witnesses and their staffs uh, for their related reports today as well. Before we begin today, uh, I want to say that we, uh, we intend to have a very robust uh, oversight uh, hearings schedule with respect to Afghanistan and uh, and I think that we'll all find that there's uh, a lot of other things we want to put on our plate as well but this is one subject given particularly the opportunity that we have to look at uh, a new strategic view of what's going on in that region uh, be an opportunity for us to uh, to work on on this as you can tell by the fact that we've scheduled our first hearing here today um, we're all going to be working on an expedited basis. Uh, I ask unanimous consent that only the chairman and ranking member of the subcommittee be allowed to make opening statements without objection so ordered. And I ask unanimous consent that the hearing record be kept open for five days so that all members of the subcommittee be allowed to submit a written statement for the record. And so ordered. Uh, and I understand we've uh, been graced with the, uh, the presence of our chairman of the full committee, Mr. Towns, and uh, I want to recognize you with Mr. Flake's uh, assent on that and, and thank you for uh, joining us in this particular hearing. Would you like to make a statement, Mr. Towns? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, right, I'm pleased to be here for, for the first hearing of the Subcommittee on National Security and Foreign Affairs. Oversight of defense and national security issues is a priority for the committee this year, and we are fortunate to have two experienced and thoughtful members, uh, Mr. Turney and Mr. Flake, leading this important subcommittee. We're pleased with that. Last month, the GAO issued a high-risk list, which included more than a dozen DOD and defense-related programs. I join with Mr. Issa in a letter to Secretary Gates notifying him and DOD's high-risk areas of a top priority for the committee and asking Secretary Gates to meet with us on his plans to fix in these problem areas. Today's hearing finding inadequate control of weapons issued to Afghanistan, of course, and, uh, to Afghan, uh, Afghan security forces is a good example of the types of issues we will address. We need to make sure that DOD has systems and policies in place that reduce risk to our national security and our troops. There is no question that our men and women in uniform are America's greatest asset. But too often DOD's management practices have been inadequate to meet the challenges that our troops and our nation face. I hope today's hearing is the first of many that identify and fix the deficiencies in our national security operations. I look forward to working together with all of you as we move forward. And I yield back to Chairman Turney. And of course, I commend Chairman Turney and to Ranking Member Flake uh, and their staff for this hearing. And of course, uh, I look forward to working with you as we fix some of the problems that we know exist. Thank you so much, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. During the last Congress, uh, this subcommittee sent three congressional delegations to Afghanistan and Pakistan, and we held seven oversight hearings. 
Uh, this Congress, the subcommittee, intends to continue our rigorous oversight. In fact, uh, I led another congressional delegation to Afghanistan and Pakistan that returned just last week. And joining me were subcommittee members Chris Van Holland, Peter Welch, and Chris Murphy, as well as Representatives George Miller and Ron Kind. The overriding takeaway from that fact-finding trip, whether it was meeting with President Karzai or President Zaderi or with the United States Ambassadors and General McKiernan or with the NGOs and other experts, is that we are in a unique moment in time to ask fundamental questions about the United States' efforts in both of those countries. What are we trying to accomplish? What are we willing to do to get to that point? What do we as a government have the capacity and the resources and the will to achieve? And most important, as a public servant, what will members say when they look into the eyes of the parents who sacrificed their son or daughter to this effort? I am encouraged that President Obama's new administration is conducting a top-to-bottom review of the United States policy toward Afghanistan and Pakistan, and it is my hope that the congressional committees will also be actively involved. I can assure you that this subcommittee will be. We will be asking tough questions and examining, among other issues, aid accountability and efficacy, including use of private contractors. United States targeting procedures, the capacity of various U.S. government agencies and departments to carry on needed activities, and the development of the rule of law and justice sectors in these respective countries. In July of 2007, the Government Accountability Office reported about the shortcomings of the United States military's efforts to account for weapons involved in the Iraq Train and Equip Program. The Inspector General's Office also filed a report. In January of 2008, Congress passed a law requiring that no defense articles be provided to Iraq until the President certifies that a registration and monitoring system has been established, and that law then listed what the system should include. It was our hope that lessons learned in that conflict would inform policies in other conflicts. To ensure that this happened, the subcommittee, together with the House Committee on Foreign Affairs, requested the Government Accountability Office review the accountability for weapons that the Defense Department obtained, transported, stored, and distributed to the Afghan National Security Forces. As it happens, the Department of Defense had also asked the Inspector General uh, to file a similar report, and Mr. Schneider's International Study Group was working on the same area. We asked the Government Accountability Office to investigate whether the Defense Department could account for the weapons intended for the Afghan Army and police. We also asked to what extent has the United States military ensured that the Afghan National Security Forces could properly safeguard and account for weapons and other sensitive equipment issued to them. The Government Accountability Office report released today answers those questions, and what they uncovered is disturbing. The International Crisis Group recently put the importance of the Afghan police this way. They said policing goes to the very heart of state building. A trusted law enforcement institution would assist nearly everything that needs to be achieved in Afghanistan. A RAND Corporation study commissioned by the Secretary of Defense on counterinsurgency strategy in Afghanistan even placed the importance of the police ahead of the Army. Building the police and counterinsurgency should be a higher priority than the creation of the Army because the police are the primary arm of the government in towns and villages across the country. They have close contact with local populations in cities and villages and will inevitably have a good intelligence picture of insurgent activity. The issue we address in detail today, weapons accountability, serves as an important and tangible harbinger of how we have been doing so far with the United States and international efforts to train and equip the Afghan police. The GAO concludes, and I quote, that accountability lapses occurred throughout the supply chain, including by the United States military, who didn't maintain complete records for about 87,000 or 36 percent of the 242,000 U.S. procured weapons shipped to Afghanistan. By not being able, and again I quote, to provide serial numbers for about 46,000 of those weapons, and by not maintaining reliable records for about 135,000 weapons that the United States military obtained for the Afghan National Security Forces from 21 other countries. We will hear from the leader of that investigation and Mr. Johnson. We will also hear about the Defense Department's Inspector General's parallel investigation that found similar accountability lapses in training and equipping Afghan National Security Forces. The Department of Defense Inspector General's report concluded that, and I quote him, the accountability, control and physical security of arms, ammunition and explosives could be compromised and vulnerable to misplacement, loss or theft. In August 2008, the Under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence put it this way about what is at stake. The security of conventional arms, ammunition and explosives is paramount as the theft or misuse of this material will gravely jeopardize the safety and sec security of personnel and installations worldwide. 
If we go back to the families of the U.S. soldiers who paid the ultimate price for our security, what if we had to tell those families not only why they were in Afghanistan, but why their son or daughter died at the hands of an insurgent using a weapon purchased by the United States taxpayers? But that's what we risk if we were to have tens of thousands of weapons we provided washing around Afghanistan off the books. The Defense Department has acknowledged these serious shortcomings. It has concurred with all three of the Government Accountability Office's recommendations and appears to be taking concrete steps to bring together greater accountability in transfers of arms to the Afghan Army and police. General Formica, the commander of the Combined Security Transition Command, Afghanistan, uh, known in an acronym uh, C. Sticker, put it this way. When we met with him in Kabul last week, he said, we have to get better because of the General Accountability Office report. But there is a huge amount of remaining work to be done, something General Formica also admits. And it is not just weapons and ammunition that we are talking about. Specified sensitive defense items, such as night vision devices, pose a special danger to the public and the United States forces if they fall into the wrong hands. Yet Sistika began issuing 2,410 such devices to Afghan National Army units in July of 2007 without establishing controls or conducting enhanced end-use monitoring. It was some 15 months before an end-use plan was developed and some, some 10 devices remain unaccounted for to this day. This subcommittee will be watching intently. The stakes are simply too high to get this wrong. But even beyond keeping track of the weapons we give to the Afghan Army and police, there are more fundamental problems, especially with the efforts to ramp up the Afghan police. For instance, the training of the Afghan police continues to lag significantly behind that of the Army. In order to examine these broader challenges in training and equipping the Afghan police, we will hear today about recently released International Crisis Group report entitled Policing in Afghanistan Still Searching for a Strategy. This report found that too much emphasis has continued to be placed on using the police to fight the insurgency rather than crime. In addition, it notes that a deteriorating security situation and political pressure for quick results has continued to obscure longer-term strategic planning and that there needs to be a much greater coherence of approach and streamlining of programs. Last year, the State Department Inspector General's Office warned, confidence that the government can provide a fair and effective justice system is an important element in convincing war-battered Afghans to build their future in a democratic system rather than reverting to one dominated by terrorists, warlords or narcotic traffickers. After 30 years of conflict and seven years of United States participation, the patience of the Afghan people is being sorely tested. A recent poll by the Asia Foundation found that 38 percent of Afghans think the country is headed in the right direction. That is down from 64 percent in 2004, while 32 percent feel it is moving in the wrong direction compared to 11 percent in 2004. These findings are reinforced by the ABC News poll released on Monday showing that 40 percent of Afghans think their country is headed in the right direction compared to 77 percent in 2005, while 38 percent of the country is heading in the wrong direction compared to 6 percent in 2005. As we contemplate a new strategic overview about to be adopted by the new administration, the condition of the Afghan National Security Forces will be of paramount concern. Included in the concern is the ability of those forces to operate, to secure territory gained and weapons afforded to them, and how this all relates to the broader U.S. efforts and plans in Afghanistan. Let's be perfectly blunt to the American people about the difficulty of the challenges ahead. The reports highlighted at this hearing, as well as the subcommittee's recent meeting with General Formica in Afghanistan, indicate serious impediments. Poor security for stored weapons, illiteracy hampering efficient operations, corruption, high desertion rates, and unclear guidance. The Defense Department has particularly noted significant shortfalls in a number of fielded and bedded trainers and mentors, which currently serves as a primary impediment to advancing the capabilities of the Afghan National Security Forces. Sea Sticker officials reported in December of last year that they only had 64 percent of the 6,675 personnel required to perform its mission overall, and only about half of the 4,159 mentors that they require. As we listen to today's testimony, I trust it will help inform whether Congress needs to legislate procedures to safeguard weapons in Afghanistan, as we did in Iraq, or to take other action in this field. The challenges are immense, but this is just too important not to get right. As I said at our hearing last year on efforts to train and equip the Afghan police, seven years after the invasion of Afghanistan, the stakes here remain enormous. Put simply, effective and honest Afghan police and a well-functioning justice system are critical to the future of Afghanistan and to the security of all Americans. 
We simply must do better in time is of the essence. I would now like to yield to Mr. Flake for his opening remarks. I thank the Chairman and I uh, want to know how excited I am to be on this sub subcommittee and uh, um, look forward to the hearings that will be held. I am pleased that we are starting with this hearing. Obviously, uh, this is a these are troubling uh, reports uh, about what is going on in Afghanistan. Is the gentleman's uh, mic on? I am sorry. I will get closer. Um, I am uh, pleased that the chairman just returned. I, I returned from Afghanistan in, in uh, December of, of last year, and uh, this was not on our radar screen when I went there, but, uh, but it will be henceforth. I would uh, like unanimous consent to issue my uh, uh, statement for the record. But uh, let me Without just objection. let me just say that this is uh, committee on oversight and reform. I'm pleased that recommendations have been made. It uh, it would be nice to have members of the administration, from the Department of Defense, and perhaps State, uh, to let us know what plans are being made to uh, implement these recommendations and how long uh, they think that, that will take. And I assume that we'll follow up in this subcommittee to make sure that these recommendations are being implemented. Uh, that said, uh, it, it is extremely troubling to find that uh, the Department of Con Defense cannot account for up to one-third of the weapons that have been issued to Afghan forces. Uh, that, uh, that is reason enough right there to, to hold a hearing and to hold people to account for what has gone on. So I, I look forward to the testimony and uh, thank all the witnesses who have come and, uh, and appreciate uh, the subcommittee taking up this important issue. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Flake. Just, uh, in relation to one of the comments that you made, I agree with you it would be nice to have the Department of Defense here. They have a policy, however, that they don't choose to sit on panels uh, where there are non-governmental officials there. And we are only having one panel at this hearing, so they were given the opportunity or have been given the opportunity and state their policy. At some point we will take that up with the Chairman. Maybe we ought to start just subpoenaing witnesses uh, and then we will design our own panels the way we want and, and uh, have the Congress run congressional hearings and the Department of Defense uh, will have an opportunity to participate. We did meet with uh, General Formica and all of his staff over there who are running C-Sticker uh, and you get that while we were in there and uh, there are at the back of the reports. I think you will see the response from the Department of Defense as well that the comments are well taken. Uh, thank you. Uh, at this point in time, we will uh, we'll hear from our witnesses and we will go in order of the, uh, of the way that they are seated on that. Let me just introduce, if I could, um, Mr. Charles Michael Johnson, Jr. Uh, Mr. Johnson is the Director of the International Affairs and Trade Division at the United States Government Accountability Office. He's had an extremely distinguished 27-year career with the Government Accountability Office, having won numerous awards, including a Special Commendation Award for Outstanding Performance, Leadership, Management, and High Congressional Client Satisfaction. I should also add that this subcommittee has kept Mr. Johnson and his team very busy over the past two years. As I noted earlier, we greatly appreciate the extensive efforts by you and all of your team. Mr. Thomas Gimbel is the Principal Deputy Inspector General of the Department of Defense. Before his current position, he was the Deputy Inspector General for Intelligence. He is a Vietnam veteran and recipient of the Bronze Star and Purple Heart. He has also received the Secretary of Defense Medal for Exceptional Civilian Service. I want to thank you for your continued service to the country, Mr. Gimbel, and for testifying today. Mr. Mark Schneider is the Senior Vice President of the International Crisis Group. He's also had a long career as a public servant. Before coming to the ICG, Mr. Schneider was the Director of the United States Peace Corps. He was also Assistant Administrator for Latin America and the Caribbean for USAID. He's also been a vital resource for the subcommittee during my tenure as Chairman and others as well. And I want to thank him for testifying today as well. It's the policy of the subcommittee to swear all of you in before you testify, so I ask you to please stand and raise your right hand. And if there's any person that will be assisting you in your testimony, I ask that they also stand and raise their right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? The record will please reflect that all of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Your full written statements will be put on the hearing record. I think as, uh, as experienced people testifying, you know that is to be the case. And we ask that you uh, testify within a five-minute period if you can. We will try to be lenient uh, with that to the extent that we can. But I know that members of the panel here are anxious to ask questions. They have probably all read your reports thoroughly. Uh, we are impressed by them and it probably uh, instigated a number of thoughtful questions. We want to get to that when we can. So, Mr. Johnson, if you would be kind enough to give us your remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman uh, and members of the subcommittee. I am pleased to be here to discuss the report GAO released today on accountability for small arms and light weapons that the U.S. has obtained for Afghan National Security Forces. 
that is the Afghan National Army and the Afghan National Police. This hearing is particularly timely given the unstable security situation in Afghanistan, which increases the potential risk of theft and loss of weapons. My testimony today will focus on three issues, the types and quantities of weapons that the Department of Defense has obtained for the Afghan National Security Forces, whether defense can account for these weapons, and the extent to which the Afghan Security Forces can account and safeguard these weapons. With respect to the first issue, from fiscal year 2002 to 2008, the United States has spent over $16.5 billion to train and equip the Afghan National Police and Army. As part of this effort, Defense through the U.S. Army and Navy purchased over 242 small arms and light weapons at a cost of about $120 million. As figure shows, a variety of small arm and lightweight weapons were purchased, rifles, pistols, machine guns, mortars, grenade launchers. In addition, Defense has reported that 21 other countries, as the Chairman has noted, provided about 135,000 weapons throughout the Department of Defense. These weapons were obtained between June 2002 and June 2008, and the international community valued these weapons at about $103 million. This brings the total number of weapons defense obtained for the Afghan security forces to over 375,000. Before I address accountability, I would like to note that the CSTICA, the Combined Security Transition Command Afghanistan, which is located in Kabul, is primarily responsible for training and equipping the Afghan security forces. CSTICA is also responsible for receiving, storing, and distributing weapons to the Afghan security forces and for monitoring the use of the U.S. procured weapons and other sensitive equipment. As for weapons accountability, we found that lapses in accountability occurred at all phases of the supply chain, including when the weapons were obtained, transported to Afghanistan, and stored at two central storage depots in Kabul. While we found that defense has accountability procedures for its own weapons, for the, our own U.S. weapons, including serial number registration and reporting and routine physical inventories of weapons stored in depots, defense did not provide clear guidance to U.S. personnel in Afghanistan, CSTIC in particular, regarding what procedures apply when handling weapons obtained for Afghanistan security forces. As such, the U.S. Army and C-Sticker did not complete records for over one-third of the 242 weapons that U.S. procured and shipped to Afghanistan. Specifically, for about 46,000 weapons, the Army and C-Sticker did not record and maintain serial numbers to uniquely enable us or anyone else to identify those weapons. For about 41,000 weapons with serial numbers recorded, C-Sticker did not have any records of their location or disposition. Furthermore, C-Sticker did not maintain reliable records, specifically serial numbers, for any of the 135,000 weapons that were obtained from the international donors. Overall, there was a lack of systematic accountability for over a half of the weapons that C-Sticker and that the U.S. government had obtained for Afghan security forces, about 200,000 weapons. During transport to Afghanistan, accountability was also compromised. For example, defense and contractors sometimes ship weapons to Afghanistan without corresponding shipping manifests that C-Sticker needed to verify receipt of weapons. At the central storage depot facilities in Afghanistan, C-Sticker did not maintain complete and accurate inventory records for weapons and allow poor security to persist. In addition, C-Sticker did not begin tracking all weapons stored at the depot by serial numbers and did not conduct routine physical inventories until July 2008. The inventories revealed a theft of 47 pistols. On a related matter, since July 2007, Defense has issued over 2,400 sensitive night, division, uh, night vision devices to Afghan National Army. For these extremely sensitive devices, Defense guidance calls for enhanced monitoring of their end use. We found, however, that C-Sticker did not begin monitoring these uh, specific devices until October 2008, about 15 months after they issued them. C-Sticker has reported in December 2008 that all but 10 of the weapons the sensitive devices have been accounted for. And with respect to the Afghan security forces capability, despite U.S. training efforts, Afghan units cannot fully safeguard and account for weapons, placing these weapons at, uh, at particular risk of theft and loss. In February 2008, C-Sticker acknowledged that it had issued weapons to Afghan security forces without proper training and accountability procedures being in place. Recognizing the need for improved accountability, C-Sticker and the State Department has deployed hundreds of U.S. mentors and trainers to, among other things, help Afghan Army and police forces 
be able to improve their accountability over weapons. The statement I'm submitting for the record details a variety of factors that have reportedly contributed to deficiencies in Afghan security forces' ability to account for weapons. Among them, lack of functioning property book operations, unclear guidance, illiteracy, and poor security. It also provides additional details on shortfalls in the number of U.S. personnel needed to train and mentor Afghan security forces and to advance the capability to safeguard and account for weapons. In summary, we have serious concerns about the accountability of weapons that defense obtained for Afghan security forces and have made several recommendations to help improve accountability. In particular, we have recommended that the Secretary of Defense establish clear accountability procedures for weapons while they are in the control and custody of the U.S., including tracking all weapons by serial numbers and conducting routine physical inventories. Secondly, we have uh, recommended that the Secretary of Defense direct CSTICA to specifically assess and verify each Afghan security forces' capacity to safeguard and account for weapons unless a special waiver is granted. Finally, we have also recommended that the, uh, sufficient and adequate resources be devoted to CSTICA's effort to train and equip Afghan security forces. Defense has concurred with our recommendations and has taken some steps to implement them. Uh, those specific steps are detailed in the statement which I will submit for the record. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, this concludes my opening and prepared statement. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Gimbel. Chairman Turney, uh, distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you this morning and discuss our report on the assessments of arms, ammunition, explosives, and control and accountability, also security assistance, sustainment of the Afghan National uh, Security Forces. Early in 2008, the Inspector General assembled a team to return to Iraq and Afghanistan to determine the status of the corrective actions resulting from our report on munitions and accountability and, and control. We also made a decision to focus on Afghanistan because our military there are facing similar challenges with respect to providing effective accountability and control being supplied to the Afghanistan um, security forces. While in Afghanistan, we also assessed security assistance program processes, Afghanistan security forces logistics sustainability, and the development of an Afghanistan military health care system. As our team redeployed out of Af Afghanistan, we outbriefed the field commanders, enabling the command to initiate some immediate corrective actions. While Sestika was making progress on accountability, we recommended that the Sestika issue policy guidance specifically for accountability control and physical security of munitions that the Mr. U.S. Chairman? is supplying to the Afghan <coughs> Could security Could you pull the microphone a little bit closer to him? Thank you very much. Thank Further, we recommended that Sestika develop a formal Is your microphone on? Yes. It is. It is. Okay. Further, we recommended that Sestika develop a formal strategy with detailed implementing guidance for mentoring the Afghanistan Ministries of Defense and Interior on accountability and control, physical security of U.S. supplied munitions. Sestika also needed to ensure that the weapons serial numbers were recorded accurately and then reported to the DOD Small Arms Light Weapons Serialization Program. The U.S. Foreign Military Sales Program has historically functioned as a peacetime security assistance program. However, in Afghanistan, the U.S. is using FMS as the principal means to equip, expand, and modernize the Afghan security forces during wartime conditions. Field commanders have noted that there's progress has been made in improving the responsiveness of FMS process in support of Afghanistan. However, we recommend that a, a wartime FMS case uh, processing times be established. In addition, we recommend that the number of personnel assigned to the Sestika Security Assistance Office and the rank of the leadership be increased to be commensurate with the mission, size, and scope of the FMS effort in Afghanistan. The ability of the Afghan security forces to operate independently partially relies on developing adequate logistical support for fielded military and police units. To accomplish this, we recommend a single integrated logistics sustainment plan be developed in coordination with the Afghanistan Ministries of Defense and Interior that links tasks, milestones, and metrics to those officers responsible for each action. Further, a formal mentoring strategy for achieving Afghanistan uh, security forces logistics sustainability also needs to be developed. <clears throat> Independent Af Afghanistan security force operations also depend on a health care system that provides field level combat casualty care, evacuation of casualties, rehabilitation support, and long-term care for disabled personnel. 
To help accomplish this, we recommended the development of a comprehensive, integrated, multi-year plan to coordinate U.S. efforts to build a sustainable Afghanistan Security Forces health care system. Also, the uh, medical mentoring team, teams need to be fully resourced, adequately trained, and supported with an interagency reach-back capability. In response to our assessment, the U.S. Central Command in Sestika did initiate a number of corrective actions. A few examples would be the uh, Central Command issued formal guidance enhancing munitions accountability and control within, er within this area of responsibility. Sestika updated its standard operating procedures on munitions accountability and control. They also in, uh, initiated formal procedures to uh, ensure that serial numbers of weapons provided to Afghan security forces are recorded in the DOD Small Arms Light Weapon Serialization Program. Central Command has initiated action to increase the number of personnel within the uh, Security Assistance Office. Finally, the uh, SESTICA has developed a strategy to improve logistics mentoring, communication and coordination by linking the support of the Afghan uh, security forces at the tactical, operational and strategic levels. Sestika and the Central Command also agreed to support an improved pre-deployment training for medical mentors that are go going to be deployed to Afghanistan. We plan to send a, the assessment team back to Afghanistan in March to review the status of the corrective actions undertaken as a result of our report. We also plan to assess the efforts to train, equip, and mentor the expanding Afghan, Afghanistan security forces. And I would, finally, I would note that General Petraeus requested that we continue to assess the uh, area of uh, Weapons Accountability in a letter to us in January of this year. Thank the uh, committee for the opportunity to discuss our ongoing efforts and be prepared to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Gimbel. Uh, Mr. Schneider, if we might hear from you, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify today on behalf of the International Crisis Group and even more for your continuing focus on these key issues uh, relating to Afghanistan and Pakistan because they will determine whether or not we succeed uh, or fail in combating Al Qaeda and the Taliban. Um, if I might, I'd like to begin, if I could, with just a brief comment about the final phrase in the title of today's hearings, strategic challenges. Because the international community does face strategic challenges in building competent and effective security forces and in stemming the increasing ability of the Taliban and their Al Qaeda allies to threaten the lives of the Afghan people and the security of Afghan state institutions as we tragically saw yesterday, and thus, one, thus once more pose a direct danger to the United States and the West. Strategic incoherence and inadequate coordination here in Washington, in Kabul, within the U.S. military, between the military and civilian government agencies, and between the U.S. and its international partners in Kabul are fatal to success in confronting the Taliban insurgency. The results of that strategic chaos have played out across Afghanistan over the past seven years. Just this uh, last month, actually, uh, the Security Council returned from a trip to Afghanistan, and it reiterated a report that some 7,000 security incidents had occurred in the first 10 months of 2008. That compared to 508 in 2003. The UN also reported that in September, 13 districts were under the control of the Taliban, another 90 we're at extreme risk. Extreme risk means that neither the UN nor the Afghan government can undertake reconstruction activities in those districts at all. Now, there are an additional 90 that are that uh, additional number that are at high risk. I think there's a map. Uh, this is this was the situation in 2003. All of the blue were low risk areas where you could carry out independently reconstruction activities. The, um, the yellow were medium risk and the salmon were, were high risk. And then uh, if we can see that, that, that uh, no, go back to that uh, the following map it, to show quickly the difference. The second map, please. Um, that one. That shows you the difference. All of the salmon colored districts are now dubbed extreme risk, meaning no reconstruction activities can independently carried out there. And the light pink go back to the high risk. The UN had to divide high and extreme risk because of the increased uh, inability to carry out activities. And the, the fact is, is that at this point, 
Every international observer, every U.S. military commander from General Mullins to Secretary Gates has agreed that the situation is deteriorating. In fact, General uh, Petraeus said um, a few weeks ago that the situation has deteriorated markedly in the past two years. And the reason is worsening security, escalating corruption, and higher levels of opium trafficking. And that's why it's crucial. You said in your, your beginning statement that we begin to get a clear overall unifying strategy. General Fields, the, um, the new Special Inspector General for Afghanistan, said that there is no overarching unified strategy for Afghanistan. Unless we have that strategy that covers security, governance, reconstruction with transparent benchmarks, there is no way that we're going to be successful in helping the Afghan government achieve the level of security and reconstruction necessary to essentially defeat a still very active, very well-financed insurgency. Now, let me just note, if I could, Mr. Chairman, um, that we do have information that there, as you've heard, that there are three reports underway to put together a strategy. And I gather that um, the, the President has asked the Security Council to coordinate um, a single report and set of recommendations from those three. And I think that that's crucial. We think that that's absolutely essential to have a single overarching strategy with benchmarks and that the Afghan government buys into and that we all are held accountable for. Now, if I could, I'll just turn quickly to the police report that you mentioned and that we wanted to focus on, and I'll discuss our findings. You've heard some of the mention here today. Our first report in August 2007 uh, indicated total collapse of all the efforts to produce a functioning Afghan National Police. The GAO conducted an excellent study last year uh, which noted that despite the appropriations of $6 billion, none of the 433 police units at that point were fully capable of standalone performance. The good news, I understand, is that at the end of this year, that first column, which indicates the various units, that is, the uniform police districts, the border police battalions, civil order uh, uh, police battalions, counter narcotics units, the total of 433. At the time that the first study was done, none were fully capable. Now I understand that some 18 are. But even so, we're talking about 18 out of 433, and very few at the district level. That's mostly ANCOP, that is the civil order uh, battalions. Now, let me just add here that while there have, been, there have been positive developments, you have a new interior minister, a new attorney general, a new U e European Union police commander, and you have the focused district development program, which I think has some chance of succeeding if, if the resources necessary are brought to bear in order to carry out that program. Just this uh, last month, the U.S. commander said that he lacks, with respect to the police, 2,300 trainers and mentors. That's at least a, a more than a third of what he needs for the carry out the task of training the police. And I think it's important, as you've heard from my two colleagues, if you don't have effective command and control over those police forces and you don't have systems in place, those weapons are simply not going to be able to be secured. And let me just make note one other point here. This, is, this now is, again, in our last report. There are 80,000 police names on the roster. They're being paid mostly by the United States, but by the International Police Fund. On any given day, 20 percent of those supposed 80,000 police officers are absent from duty. Another 17 percent listed on the rolls are actually the names of dead or wounded police officers as a means of providing uh, pensions and benefits to the family. The question is, of those who are, let's say, the somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 to 30,000 police who are not there. The UN actually says there are about 55,000 police in the field. The question about where those weapons of those police went is a significant question. And there's one other question. This refers, the, re the reports that have been done refers to the Afghan security forces. What about the auxiliary police 
the 11,000 that were started up two years ago, only 3,000 of whom currently are found, and I mean found, were, were they given weapons? If so, where are they? And finally, there's a proposal now to start up a new community guard program outside of the structure of the police in the Pashtun areas. And without going to the question of the rationale for doing that, as opposed to devoting your resources to, to in fact, staff up, train, and mentor, and equip the Afghan National Police effectively, the question is, are those passion, the weapons being given to those guards in those communities, are, are they being monitored and controlled? And I should also note they're actually getting paid more than the local Afghan police. We have a serious questions about that program. So what do we say in terms of what needs to be done? First, the fundamental issue is focusing on police as police, not as war fighters. Their role is to uphold the law and fight crime, not to fight wars. Putting police in the front lines against the Taliban has resulted in three times more police than army troops killed last year. That not only hurts morale, but it obviously depresses recruitment. It makes it very difficult to maintain a successful police force. The basic requirements for reversing these conditions begin with ensuring the police reform occurs within the larger state building effort, that you clearly define and respect the roles and responsibility of police military and intelligence agencies, that you ensure that the International Policing Coordination Board, which is chaired by the Minister of the Interior with international involvement, including us, that it does, is permitted to coordinate policy and that there's parallel reforms in justice as well. This is essential. If we don't build a police, we're not going to have a rule of law, we're not going to have an effective government, and we're not going to succeed in confronting the insurgency. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Schneider. Thank all of the witnesses for your testimony. We're going to proceed at this point in time to uh, questions for the panel. Um, you know, for all of you, you know, it seems uh, we certainly thought that the lessons of Iraq would be carried over to Afghanistan without much difficulty. It seemed to make common sense that you would want to make sure you knew where your weapons were going. And I note that on the uh, Government Accountability Office report, uh, Mr. Johnson, you say that in January of 2009, just earlier this year, the Defense directed the Defense Security Cooperation Agency to lead an effort to establish a weapons registration and monitoring system in Afghanistan consistent with controls mandated by Congress for weapons provided to Iraq. So if they follow through on that, you would think that at least that portion uh, of which the United States has direct control over the weapons can be rectified and can be taken care of. That would be the weapons flown into Kabul, you know, that we would then get the serial numbers at that point in time, uh, monitor the transportation, which was not being done monitor the transportation from the airport to the two storage facilities, one for the Army and one for the police, maintain it securely, uh, and keep an inventory and do regular inventory checks while they're there. Uh, and then when they're distributed, I think that becomes the problem. Uh, would you agree? Um, yeah, I think that if that was implemented, that goes a long way towards what we have called for. What is missing, though, uh, from our interpretation of the NDA requirements uh, is that there is no uh, requirement for routine physical inventory. We think that is significant. That needs to be done to um, deal with the issue of, of poor security and, and potential theft and loss of those weapons out of the storage depots. Okay. So inventory periodically during the time that they are stored in those depots? Correct. Makes sense. That is the one additional thing. And I think we should be able to do that. And in conversations with General Vermiker and his staff, they seem to be on that and, and ready to implement, even though they do run into difficulties there in terms of staffing. Uh, and they weren't able to give us any assurances that they would continue to have adequate staff to do that. And then we run into the problem of uh, the Afghan forces. If they are going to supplement that, we run into literacy problems, numeracy problems on that, uh, problems of people not showing up for work, people leaving after they have been trained, corruption. Uh, we noticed in, uh, I think, Mr. Schneider's report as well as others that uh, oftentimes it was the police chief that was mentioned or the logistics officer locally that was mentioned in corruption reports. Uh, so weapons may be going out the door in turn for, for monetary compensation at that level. Uh, as Mr. Schneider says, people leaving, uh, you know, after they have the weapons, just leaving the force and taking the weapon with them. We had incidents reported to us, that, uh, a, a cultural thing I suspect is that when people came in with their AK-47, throw it on a pile, go have lunch, come back out, take any AK-47. So a little tough to check the serial numbers and work on that because that uh, is the way that they are done. 
So knowing that we have all those difficulties, the difficulty in securing the weapons once they're in the police and Army's hands, uh, corruption, uh, et cetera, on that, what are your prospects? What do you think the prospects are for getting a handle on this to gain assurance that weapons can be accounted for all the way through? And what time frame do you think it is going to be involved in getting to that point in time? Well, I think the, the key, if I may, um, and I think my colleagues would agree, but they can weigh in. Uh, I think the key to success or some progress in this area is the filling of the military personnel shortages. I think until that is addressed, uh, I really don't think the sea sticker in terms of its ability to complete its objective of training um, or mentoring the Afghan security force in getting this done could be accomplished. Well, like so much else, I don't mean, I'm interrupting your, your question, Mr. Gimbel, here on that, but like so much else, we had testimony last year uh, that told us that the 2,500 short at least on mentors and much more when it comes to trainers were all in Iraq. Like so much else had been diverted instead of having a focus on Afghanistan. Do we see any signs of that changing, of those uh, numbers increasing uh, with any sort of systematic approach to it? Well, we, we do understand that we have some ongoing work uh, underway looking at the efforts to uh, um, reform the Afghan National Police in particular, and we know that currently the situation is that there are really no dedicated resources for the training of the police. They are taking resources from the efforts to train the Army to actually undercarry, undertake the efforts to train the police. Um, so obviously I think with the plans going forward, uh, that's a policy decision in terms of where these additional resources that are slated to come to Afghanistan are going to be um, um, put. Uh, we do know that C-Sticker has made a request for specific forces uh, to fill these particular positions. And, and C-Sticker envisions, from what uh, they were telling us, some 14 to 16 mentors and people out in each team Correct. with each uh, district police department as they go out to mentor and stay there for security purposes so they can do the policing work, and they're well short of that. That's correct, Mr. Chairman. So, Mr. Schneider, that leads me to the question you mentioned in your testimony uh, that we're not doing an effective job of looking through our National Guard uh, troops for people that are police uh, and do have a, uh, some background in law and order or whatever and sort of integrating them or transferring them uh, to these positions. Do you see any movement in that area? Well, I, I, I must admit, Mr. Chairman, that uh, I have asked uh, several people uh, in the military about this. They all agree, obviously, there are some 675,000 civilian police around the U.S., different places. A good 10 percent, at least, they estimate, if not more, um, are in the reserves or in the National Guard, um, but they're not formed in police training units. They've signed up for doing other things in their reserve, whether it's driving trucks or being infantrymen. And the question is, is whether or not uh, they would have to change their contract. And I suggested that the President of the United States said that this was an important uh, for the national security that there would be f some way would be found for the contracts to be changed. But there's no way this is going to succeed if you don't get those trainers and mentors out there. Now, when Russia spent 10 years uh, in Afghanistan trying to do the same thing we're trying to do, build up the Afghan national security forces, and, and they failed. Uh, what are the prospects on a zero to 100 percent scale, each of the witnesses quickly, you think that we have to succeed uh, within the next three to five years? Mr. Johnson. Um, Chairman, Chairman, we were here uh, last June and we reported on uh, the limited numbers, one, I think it was two for the Afghan National Army being cap fully capable and none, as uh, Mr. Snyder has mentioned, for the police. We are aware that there have been some progress made in both areas. Uh, so under some of the revised training efforts like the Focus District Development Program, which you seem to be aware of when you mentioned the uh, police mentor teams, uh, they are making progress. But again, I go back to the point that unless those military personnel are provided, uh, to success and continue success in terms of furthering uh, make progress in that area will be challenged. Mr. Gimbel? I, I would agree with uh, Mr. Johnson, but the, uh, I think the challenge will be is that there can, it can be progress, there will be progress made. Now, when you put it in absolute terms of 100 percent successful, I'm, I'm not prepared to have an opinion on that at, at this point. But I do think there is there is increased emphasis, and, and I think that's good. And it's just going to be a lot of challenges ahead. If I, if I may jump back in again, one, one other point. Again, going back to when we made this point in June when we did the work for your uh, subcommittee then, we made a specific um, matter for congressional consideration, and that dealt with the fact that we felt like there needed to be a coordinated detailed plan between the U.S. Department of Defense and State Department to make sure that we have sufficient milestones and benchmarks to measure 
uh, progress, and we have not seen that. Um, again, I think that's still an integral part of going forward that needs to be addressed. Thank you. Mr. Schneider. I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to be even more pessimistic. Um, uh, unless there's a, a major change, because you're not going to be able to, to, even if you get the trainers, you're not going to be able to succeed in establishing an effective police force if the rest, if it's alone. It has to be part of an overall process of expanding the capacity of the government. If, if you just have the police and the judges throw out everybody that they arrest, and it's not going to work. So it needs to be part of a rule of law. Now, do I think it's possible to increase that number on the board from, let's say, 18 to 100? Yes, I think it is. And I think that, that we need to find a way to have a, a benchmark, sort of a critical path that says, in three years, we want to be here. Right. What do we have to do to get there? And if that means 3,000 police trainers and mentors on the ground three months from now, then we have to figure out how to do it. Thank you very much. Thank, thank all of you. Uh, Mr. Flake, you're recognized. Thank the chairman and the witnesses. Uh, Mr. Johnson, you mentioned importance of inventory uh, with the depot, uh, saying that we don't seem to have a problem with the munitions as they go and the, the, the arms as they go from you know, transport to the depot, and you recommend inventory that we haven't been doing. Does that inventory just apply to the arms there in the, in the, in the depot or in those warehouses, or an inventory of those that have, been, that have gone out and uh, that they can keep track of? Well, a couple points in response to that. One, there is actually a problem before it even gets to the storage depot. Um, the equipment is, is flown into Kabul. And what we discovered, and the team that went there, uh, what we discovered was that uh, once it gets in Kabul, there is no shipping manifest for C sticker to actually do inventory to make certain that it received what it should have received. So even before it gets to the storage depot, there's a, a weakness there. In addition, the U.S. basically hands over uh, Kasi or the Afghan forces actually deliver the equipment to the storage depot. So we basically do not retain um, custody, even though I, I believe at that point correct me if I'm wrong, Council, we have title of the equipment. We give it over to the Afghan um, security force to actually transport it to the storage depot, which we are managing the storage depot, even though it's intended for the Afghan security forces to manage it. So there's a couple of things here where we see some gaps and weaknesses. Um, yes, there is a critical point where we think it needs to be, you know, at least checked when it comes in country, as well as a full inventory done routinely at the inventory, uh, at the storage depot. Okay. <clears throat> but in terms of, of inventory, once it goes out in the field, um, this inventory you're talking about uh, doing, that would entail uh, keeping track of those that are in the field through serial number that, that at a certain point, certain date, they have to account mm -hmm. for those as well? And that, that's at minimum, what done. should be uh, known as a record of the location disposition of those items. Uh, if you deliver it or deliver it to an Afghan security forces or somewhere else, okay. then at least having a record of where it went to is important, and that did not exist. In addition, when we talk about sensitive devices such as the night vision uh, devices we mentioned earlier, there was no inventory of those. There is enhanced an enhanced in use monitoring requirement for those specific devices because they have sensitive technology, and that was not done um, prior to us coming uh, to Kabul. Mr. Schneider mentioned the auxiliary forces, uh, different units completely, and that there is, is uh, no accounting for the weapons that uh, were issued there. Uh, do you have any idea? Well, we did not specifically look at it by unit, by police unit. Uh, in particular, we do know, in res um, sort of somewhat of an update, uh, that there were plans where, again, I mentioned we have some ongoing work looking at reform of the police. The auxiliary police forces are being folded within uh, the rest of the uh, um, Afghan National Police Forces uh, through a vetting process that they're going through. Uh, so specifically with respect to their specific equipment, we did not look at it by unit, but as a whole. Mr. Schneider, you mentioned that uh, attrition rate for the Afghan police was 21 percent or so, another 17 percent on the rolls that may or may not be uh, active. Uh, what's the attrition rate uh, for the Afghan army? I, I don't have that. Um, uh, All right. I, I, I seem to recall uh, when I was there that that was a similar figure in the 20 percent range. Um, that any, any, I would think, serious inventory uh, would require uh, a lot of coordination 
uh, with uh, the Afghan government, obviously, and, and cooperation. Do you see that uh, eminent? Uh, you, you don't seem to be very optimistic that that's coming. Well, I, mean, I think that you've identified one, one of the fundamental issues here, which is, is that there has to be a, an absolute marriage between our efforts to stand up and to train and equip the Afghan National Security Forces, police and military, and the Afghan government in terms of their goals and their determination to have an independent, non-corrupt police force. And as the chairman mentioned, until we get satisfaction that they are not naming police chiefs who are linked to drugs, um, as one example, this is not going to work. And I should just add on that point, there is, there is a body which was designed and agreed to by the Afghan government and the international community called the, the Senior um, Appointments um, Review Commission, I believe. And that was designed to, in a sense, have an opportunity to weed out these individuals before they are named. That body has been almost defunct. That is the kind of institutional mechanism that we need to say if we are going to continue providing the support, that has to be there and it has to be acting to prevent corrupt police chiefs from being named. Right. If you will indulge me, just, uh, Mr. Gimbel, what should the remedy be uh, if, if we don't get that cooperation and uh, we still find that uh, we are unable to account for the weapons that we have issued? What should the remedy be? What are our choices? Let me, <clears throat> my, my version of the uh, accountability goes like this. There's a couple of levels. The uh, part that uh, Mr. Johnson talked about is the chain of custody from receipt in the country to the depot. And, he's, and I totally agree with his, his uh, analysis of that, that there are breakdowns there. But I think the issue of the weapons that have already been issued out, what we have to do there is we have to train our mentors out there to have the Afghans determine their own system of accountability. And we need to have the record of where we turn the, the weapons over to an Afghan unit. But we also have a responsibility to have the Afghans have their own accountability system if we're trying to develop their, uh, you know, their capabilities in either the, the Army or the police. And, and that will be one of the parts of the, of the plan. And you know, we talked about the strategic plan and all that. I, I'm going to be a little bit more narrow focus in that. But in, in the, uh, the uh, Sestika arena, we had been critical in our report of October that there was no central plan for, like, for logistics sustainment and what have you. There's a number of their seven draft plans out, and we'd recommended that they get a single integrated plan that would bring this together. But part of that plan would be, as we've done in, a, in Iraq when we looked at weapons accountability there, we've actually gone back down and follow up and go down to the units when there was handoff and inventoried the uh, Iraqi uh, storerooms to see how, what kind of accountability they have. We have a team going back into theater uh, in March, and one of the, one of the uh, taskers will be, hopefully, that we can get down to some Afghan units to see how, we, how well we are encouraging them to develop their own accountability systems. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fake. Mr. Driehaus, you recognize five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I got to tell you, as, as a new member to this committee, I am very disturbed. Uh, by this report, and I think the average American would be very disturbed by this report. Um, you, you would think that, given the experience in Iraq, we would certainly have the systems in place uh, to track uh, these weapons. Uh, I guess I, I'd like, I have a couple questions. First of all, um, give me the, the worst case. You know, I, I'm sure we're all looking at this from the worst case scenario. You know, are these weapons falling into the hands of the Taliban or Al Qaeda, and is there any evidence to suggest? That that in fact has happened, um, you know. Despite you know all the various concerns we have in terms of tracking and monitoring, uh, do we have any evidence that in fact these weapons are getting into the hands of hostile forces? Um, there are reports uh, that we have looked at. Some of the uh, mentor reports or the contract mentor reports that are done, where they actually go in and do some of the assessments of the Afghan security forces' um, capability to account for things. Um, some of those reports uh, have had some allegations that reported a theft of weapons and potentially weapons being sold to um, enemies. I, I guess given that, um, when, when I look at this tracking system as it's been described, is there a better way to do this? And, and not just in, in accounting and, you know, putting the necessary personnel in place uh, to make sure that we're monitoring and accounting. Uh, for the weapons as they move forward, given the serial numbers. But, you know, we all have cell phones here. 
that can be tracked quite easily uh, using sophisticated technology. Um, is there better technology that the military can be using in order to track their weapons rather than the serial numbers that they're currently using? I'm not aware of a better one. I think there has to be discipline in the system. And, and if you go back and compare the U.S. military and how they track by serial number and, and what have you, that works very well. We have good accountability and control. What we have here in this part of the challenge here was that, uh, and going back when you talk about Iraq and Afghanistan, some of the reasons that we didn't learn the lessons and carry them over to Afghanistan because they were happening at the same time. You know, the, the problems you had in Iraq with weapons accountability was you had the same problems ha happening in Afghanistan at the same time. So I think the, uh, the other part of the challenge is a lot of these weapons that we're, we're getting the serial con serialized control on, there was never agreement. There was a lack of uh, understanding on the part of the uh, folks in theater that, uh, that the DOD accountability rules applied. And uh, you, you mentioned, Chairman, in your uh, opening uh, remarks about the uh, Undersecretary of Defense's letter of August of 2008. Well, that was actually was a result of our first report, and it was. And what that really says, in, in my view, is that he's telling the, the people in theater that the DOD policies and procedures that we live by apply to all the weapons that we buy with U.S. monies, and that was kind of a, a, a point of uh, misunderstanding up until then. And as a result of that, now we've we've been able to start moving forward with you know the uh, the, the good. Policies. Now, there's a, the next challenge is that you got you can have the g great policies, but you got to have implementation. One of the challenges in Afghanistan when, when I was over there was that uh, they did have a uh, what they call the core IMS, is an off-the-shelf uh, uh, tracking system. The problem there was it wasn't being very uh, well input, and there was no quality assurance that you didn't have duplicate numbers. And there's another challenge that a, a large number of these weapons coming in are, are Eastern Bloc weapons, AK-47s. And they don't have the, uh, the serialized discipline that, that the U.S. arms manufacturers have. You have a lot of duplicate numbers, uh, non-number uh, non uh, uh, characters that the systems won't pick up. So the, the part of the challenge of getting control of this is, is determining how to best deal with, with those kinds of issues, too. So it's, gonna be, it's, a, it's a real challenge to go back out and recreate this. But I think there's, there's efforts underway, and uh, we're, we're hoping to go back in March and see some progress in that area. I, I think finally, Mr. Chairman, that you know we, we all understand the necessity to be arming the security forces and, and the police forces in, in Afghanistan. Um, but there is, uh, I think, a very real question as to whether or not we should continue, uh, it, given the, the problems that you have identified, uh, does it make sense that we would continue to deliver weapons in, into uh, the country without having these systems in place, and should we stop uh, delivery of weapons? Uh, for a certain period of time until we are insured and the taxpayers are assured that, in fact, the systems are in place? Uh, I think the plans going forward is actually to do that. Um, defense has agreed to implement our recommendation, has already taken steps to do so. Uh, we are aware that um, in 2008 there was a recognition that more needs to be done by the commanding general. There was a policy implemented for the police in particular that no weapons could be issued to the police. Uh, without assurance that they are able to properly account for and safeguard those weapons. Uh, we have not went back in to specifically test that, uh, but that was their uh, new policy. And under their new focused div district development program, their training effort, um, that is a part of that whole effort where they train them as a unit and then trying to ensure that they have uh, sufficient uh, controls in place to safeguard and account for weapons. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, if, if I might just ask on that. We had uh, the Congress passed a law regarding Iraq uh, asking for a certification before the arms went out as to the status on that. Has anybody been back, either the Inspector General's office or the uh, GAO, to see how that's going in Iraq? We, we looked, we made a number of those recommendations. Uh, you passed the, uh, the legislation, I think we, we had come back from there. But let me just give you kind of an update on what we saw last year. When we went in in, in, uh, in 07, we made recommendations to list the uh, serial numbers of weapons on the outside of the cases, have the manifest that uh, Mr. Johnson was talking about pr provided into the uh, receiving area. And uh, so back uh, last May we were over and I actually led the team back over there. We uh, went out and inventoried weapons at uh, Abu Ghraib. Uh, they looked at the serial numbers on the outside of the case, broke some of the cases open, counted them. 
had a pretty good accuracy rate. We went down also, we went back into the, Af uh, the Iraqi uh, areas like in Baghdad Police College and some of the police colleges up in Kurdistan and, 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 and inventoried weapons on hand there both in the arms rooms and then also in the uh, uh, at Baghdad Police College, that's a central storage place for the uh, police. And uh, while they weren't perfect, there was a lot of progress being made and there was, uh, there was some accountability being established. Now, we intend to go back again to follow up on those by going back into the uh, things. Our Afghanistan re uh, part of that trip was, was the uh, initially, we, we actually went out to uh, Depot 1 and uh, 22 bunkers. We did not on that trip get to go down to any of the Afghan units. That's what part of this issue will be when we go back next month is we want to go down, go back out to the 22 bunkers, uh, Depo 1, and then also go to some of the forward deployed units to see what kind of accountability. One, do you have accountability when it's in U.S. possession as it's turned over to the Afghans? And then what kind of provisions are we making to establish some kind of accountability and control, recognizing uh, that it has to be uh, largely what their way of doing business. but. Uh, there should be some, some thought of accountability for the weapons and, and munitions that we provide. Thank you, Mr. Kimball. Uh, thank you for your indulgence, Mr. Duncan. Uh, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, according to the Congressional Research Service, we've spent $173 billion in Afghanistan since 2001. And as far as I'm concerned, it's pouring money down a rat hole. It's a complete waste. I think if there are any fiscal conservatives, uh, uh, left in the Congress, they should be horrified by the waste that's going on over there. Uh, General Petraeus uh, said in an article in the Washington Post three days ago that uh, the situation in, our, uh, in Afghanistan, uh, uh, despite all this money, has deteriorated markedly in the past two years. That, those are his words. And he said this, he said, Afghanistan has been known over the years as the graveyard of empires. And if we're not careful, it's going to help be the graveyard of our empire as well. Uh, Professor Ian Lustig of the University of Pennsylvania wrote recently, he said, he, talk, he talked about the money feeding frenzy on, of the war on terror. And he said this, wrote this, nearly seven years after September 11, what, uh, 2001, what accounts for the vast discrepancy between the terrorist threat facing America and the scale of our response? Why, absent any evidence of a serious terror threat is the war on terror so enormous, so all-encompassing, and still expanding? The fundamental answer is that al-Qaeda's most important accomplishment was not to hijack our planes, but to hijack our political system. For a multitude of politicians, interest groups, professional associations, corporations, media organizations, universities, local and state governments, and federal agency officials, the war on terror is now a major profit center a funding bonanza, and a set of slogans and sound bites to be inserted into budget, project, grant, and contract proposals. For the country as a whole, however, it has become a maelstrom of waste. And I, I just don't see with a national debt of $11,315,000,000, an incomprehensible figure, and now they, the GAO tells us over $55 uh, trillion in unfunded future pension liabilities, it's just not going to be long at all before we're not going to be able to pay all of our Social Security and Medicare, veterans' pensions, and all the things we've promised our own people if we don't stop spending money in ridiculously wasteful ways. And of course, what does the Defense Department tell us? Just as they always do, what they want is more money to spend over there and more troops. Bruce Fine, who was a high-ranking official of the Reagan administration, wrote just a few days ago in the Washington Times that we should, he, he said it's ridiculous that we have troops in 135 companies and approximately 1,000 foreign military installations. And he said we should redeploy our troops uh, uh, to the United States. He said no country would dare attack. Our defenses and retaliatory capability would be invincible, esprit de corps would be at its zenith because soldiers would be fighting to protect American lives and American soil, not Afghan pe peasants. The redeployment would end the United States casualties in Iraq, Afghanistan, and elsewhere. It would end the foreign resentments our enemies created by unintended killings of civilians and the insult to pride excited by foreign occupation. And he ended this column in saying the American empire should be abandoned and the republic restored the United States would be safer, freer, and wealthier. And I can tell you I agree with him. It's just like this stimulus that we're dealing with. 
there's a lot of good things in, in that stimulus package. But I can tell you this, we can't afford it. I wish every family in this country could have a million dollar mansion and drive a new Cadillac or Mercedes, but they can't afford it. And if we can, and, and we're on this addiction to spending, and we go in for these short-term fixes that will satisfy for a while, but they're going to cause us serious trouble later on. If a family is deeply head over heels into debt, uh, they don't go out and just immediately double or triple their spending or they get in even worse trouble. And I hate to say it because I'm not a pacifist and I, I consider myself to be very pro-military, but the Defense Department has turned into the Department of Foreign Aid and has become the most wasteful department probably in the entire federal government. And fiscal conservatives should be the ones most upset about that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Duncan. You'll be pleased to know that we intend to look into many of the matters that you mentioned this year. I don't think that there is widespread disagreement uh, amongst Thank members you. of this panel, at least, and we see it as part of our oversight responsibility, taking a look at those 750 or 1,000 bases and their mission. Uh, and their impact on that, as well as all the procurement issues that the Government Accountability Office reported uh, on last year, $750 billion of, uh, $275 billion, rather, of potential waste in contracts over time, over schedule and over budget. So uh, we'll be doing all of that and appreciate your cooperation with that. Thank you. Mr. Lynch, you're recognized for five minutes. Want me to sit over there? Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank the ranking member as well, and I appreciate the witnesses uh, for helping us with, with our work. Uh, Mr. Gimbel, uh, we had a similar problem a couple of years ago, uh, as you mentioned, in Iraq. I think we had 191,000 weapons go missing, most of them uh, small arms. But uh, in, in response to that problem, uh, myself, Mr. Platts, a uh, number of uh, investigators from the committee uh, actually, this subcommittee actually uh, went into Taji Weapons Depot in Iraq, and uh, basically, DOD uh, had had a good program in place. They had, uh, as uh, as the Iraqi security forces were coming out of training, they had uh, they had a building there in, at Taji. When they were assigned a weapon, the the serial number was recorded. There was actually, you know, they had four laptop computers in, 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 the, uh, in the central facility there at, at, uh, at Taji. The individual, whether it was a soldier or it was a uh, security officer, police officer, they had their picture taken with the weapon and, you know, it, it did a pretty good job. A little late, but, but it did a good job. Why, why don't we have this system in Afghanistan? It seemed to be very cost effective. and. Let's face it, Afghanistan is a lot poorer than Iraq. Uh, most of these uh, young men, and that's basically what we're talking, and, and older uh, men, uh, are getting assigned a weapon that is probably as valuable as any, anything that they own in their household. And uh, we've got some corruption issues, some big corruption issues there, as, as you well know. Uh, you know, especially not, so, not as much with the Army, the ANA, as we do with the, with the police. But you, you've got all these issues here. It's just a, you know, it's, it's almost a certainty we're going to have a problem here unless we, we put something in place to address it. So I've got to ask you, wh why didn't we just take the system, the good system that you've got going on in Iraq, and apply it to Afghanistan? I think that is a good question. The, the, uh, and we hope to address some of those issues when we go back in March. The, uh, I would just add, though, that in the, on the Iraqi side, they also put in some provisions that if you lost a weapon such as a Glock, it would, you, they uh, actually fined the uh, people about a year's salary. Right. And they had a number of those other, that was the Iraqi government doing that. Uh, I think it has to be a, a joint effort between the Afghan uh, government and the, and the U.S. And, and I think a lot of that comes back to this, this mentoring teams that we, we need to have out there. Uh, agreed that the uh, process, we need, to, we need to put that in and we'll, we'll look at that. But I agree that, that Iraq process has, has been a, a huge step forward. Yeah. Well, I'll be back in Taji in a little bit, and I'll, I'll be in Afghanistan in a, in a, in a little while as well. And I'm going to look for some type of accountability to be, to be inserted. Remember, in, in one of the problems that we got it right in Iraq eventually, and we got it right now. And you have to remember that CPA 3, that Coalition Provisional Authority Rule 3, allows every Iraqi 
to have a weapon in their home for, for self-defense. So basically, every Iraqi house and the weapon of choice was an AK-47. Uh, so, you know, that, that, that's a pretty, pretty steep problem there, and they got that under control. There is no reason from a cost or a, uh, you know, technology uh, view here uh, that we shouldn't be able to put some type of very responsible and, and, and uh, exact system in place that will, will track these weapons. And with, uh, with the expectation that our troop levels are going to be increased substantially there, the risk is, is even greater. Uh, let me ask you, do we have a central weapons facility, uh, weapons depot facility in, in Afghanistan that we're using, or do we have multiple sites? You actually have two primary ones, uh, 22 bunkers and then uh, Depot uh, 1, which are in Kabul. Where, where are they, sir? I'm sorry. In Kabul. Kabul. All of them are in Kabul? They're both in Kabul, yes. Okay. That simplifies yeah. things a little bit. But let me All go right. back to Taji just for a moment. Uh, there's another part of the issue. You, when you were having the issuance of the weapons to the basic trainees coming out of their training facility, they also have a huge weapon storage over there, and they have uh, the, the uh, captured weapons. and we. There were some challenges with accountability on, on uh, cap, uh, captured weapons, but we were able to go back in and inventory the supply side of the, of the uh, weapons over there last uh, May and saw some pretty good accountability and some systems being developed and they're automating some of their, uh, uh, what I call wholesale level weapons accountability, the, you know, the warehouse uh, operations. Okay. But the truth of it is that the Afghanistan uh, process is much more primitive, in my personal opinion, than the, than the Iraq. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Thanks, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Lynch. my time has expired. I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Foster, you're recognized for five minutes. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I'm also a new member of this committee, but it's, this is a matter of some personal interest to me for actually two reasons. In the mid-'70s, my parents spent a year in Afghanistan where my father was responsible for the first and for the long time the only edition of the Afghan legal proceedings where he had um, you know, spent a year of riding a circuit in a Land Rover trying to um, you know, actually get an appreciation for the rule of law and the value of actually writing down court decisions and came away with it um, sort of skeptical thinking that we are generations away from actually having what's needed um, in, from a cultural point of view of having a real appreciation of the rule of law. And I, I'd be interested in your, your reactions, whether we've um, made progress in the last 30 years when a lot of what, you know, was wiped out, the, the government there was wiped out first by the Russians and then subsequent war. Um, and the second reason is that the largest National Guard deployment um, coming out of my district, actually out of Illinois, um, is responsible for the training and mentoring of the Afghan National Police. And I want to make sure that you know, these kids are, are kept as safe as we can. Um, I'd like to push a little bit, um, I guess this is for Mr. Schneider and, and Gimbel, on, as the question of whether there may be some technological um, fixes or improvements. At a sort of fundamental level, you can easily imagine that um, if you're not sure that a, a policeman is out, um, you know, doing his rounds, that if he's carrying a cell phone, he can sit there and take a picture every 10 minutes, and it can be monitored by our wonderful European collaborators. Um, and, and there is no reason why some simple thing like that can't make sure that we at least know who's doing their job as a policeman out on the beat. And, um, you know, there, there are more advanced technological things that you can imagine everything up to and including having smart guns where you actually, you know, the, this technology where you recognize the owner and the gun will not fire unless it, it's been programmed to the owner. That would make it very hard to steal a gun and abuse it. And, and just intermediate things such as GPS tracking devices, um, something that alerts um, alerts uh, a radio signal when the gun is, is fired. And, and I was wondering, is there, to your knowledge, even a research program that would um, get this technology field testable? And, and do you think it's promising? Um, I mean, I, I think the, there's, Afghanistan remains, I think, 174 out of 177 poorest country in the world. Um, the access to basic technology is pretty limited outside uh, the major cities. Um, at this stage, um, I'm not sure that you would be able to, to use cell phones at all. Um, now, Kabul is another issue um, that uh, there might be an ability in some of the major cities. Um, but I think that your point is well taken. That is, you, you need to look at all of these issues in relation to what is going to be possible to use to bring up the capacity 
of um, effectiveness of the Afghan National Police and, and the uh, monitoring and oversight. Uh, one of the points I made is that we are currently, if we train the, the police as they are planned, it is two months of training. Uh, even in Haiti, we have seven months of training required. Um, and the other is that you mentioned your, your father and the, the question about the, the rule of law. Uh, this is a civilian police force. It has to be seen as part of the rule of law. We are doing very little. I think still the government of Italy is responsible for the lead in the uh, area of the judiciary and justice. And th there is a lot more that needs to be done there. It all doesn't have to be, you know, federal courts. But you need to have some mechanism like riding a circuit um, with Afghans who are, who relate to those local districts. There is a, a program underway that you are aware of, the National Solidarity Program, and there is a new effort at the local government effort uh, that is focused on the economic side, community action. But that needs to be linked to the local district police and, and local judiciary as well. And that still has yet to be done. Could I just make one other point, Mr. Chairman? And that is that in relation to this, that this is all being done, led by the military. The military is running civilian police in terms of the training. In an ideal world, it would not be the military responsible for civilian police training. It would be civilian police. And we don't have the capacity in the U.S. government to deal with the rule of law internationally in post-conflict situations in any kind of comprehensive fashion that would deal with civilian police, justice, corrections, cops, courts, corrections. We can't do it all together and we can't do it from a civilian side where we have the expertise. If I may point out, I do want to note that the GAO is currently um, probably in about three weeks we are going to issue a report on the efforts to reform the Afghan National Police. So we will be touching on some of the issues you are addressing. Uh, but I would like to note that there is an effort underway to provide each police officer with a biometric ID card that has a smart chip in it. And are, are there, is there any kind of um, cashless um, electronics funds transfer economy in Afghanistan? Um, I understand that, for example, in Africa, you know, that is a significant part of the economy and it must be very powerful in, in reducing the corruption or at least identifying where it is happening. And I was wondering, you know, since a, we control a large fraction of the money that is going into the economy, whether we could actually make progress along those lines. Some of those things you mentioned, um, use of cell phones, those are things that are being considered. But we will um, probably address that in more detail in the report uh, that is tentatively due on March the 9th. Okay. And, and if, just I could, a if I could add to that, there is an effort in the pay and reform um, uh, program to uh, send um, the money for the individual police officers to accounts that they would have access to rather than to their commander who obviously traditionally skims off a substantial amount. So there is an effort along those lines. Except okay. that there are now reports of a lot of commanders accompanying the individual police officers to the bank. <laughs> And just, so just a, a, yeah, uh, one last quick question. The, um, you mentioned that I think it was 17 percent um, of the salaries being drawn are actually for dead or, um, or, or wounded right. policemen. And is, is there a plan to actually make a, a, a pension program? Um, you know, this sounds like money that maybe is, is not being misspent, but it would be very nice mm -hmm. to just in terms of knowing what the actual force is. Is, is that going to be separated out into a, some sort of pension program? My understanding is that, that that is an issue that has not yet been dealt with. They have discussed the, it, the, the need for that, um, but so far as I know, there is not a formal program. Okay. Thank you. You may. Thank you. We are going to do another round if you, if you want to stick around for that. But, uh, Mr. Schneider, you know, the point has been made several times here about you know, why just can't we do in Afghanistan what we now think we are doing in Iraq on this. And I, I want to make two points and ask you to respond to that. One is uh, there seems to be a wholly different level of corruption in Afghanistan permeating the society like something we have never seen in Iraq or elsewhere. And secondarily, we have a much higher degree of illiteracy and enumeracy uh, in Afghanistan than we have in Iraq, which is a fairly educated, uh, capable uh, population there. So, you know, without overcoming those obstacles, we are probably not ever going to be able to get the kind of inventory and security for weapons that we really want to have. Is that your read as well. I mean, that is clearly one, one major factor. But, but another one as well is the fact that you have got a, a very a thriving uh, opium industry in Afghanistan. 
that finances corruption right across the board. Uh, and until you do something more effective in dealing with the opium, particularly the trafficking side, that is the processing and the trafficking where the real money is, it's going to be very difficult to eliminate the corruption that, uh, that ha continues to exist. I mentioned we're positive about the new Minister of Interior. And, and I just would just note that when he was appointed, which is just in October, I mean, he basically said administrative corruption in the Ministry of Interior and the police leadership is irrefutable. Jobs are being bought and the poor people are paying the price. And part of the reason is because those are the places where the drug traffickers need assistance to move the product. And I will say that we need to see within this overall strategy of a much more coherent counter-drug program that we have today. And it needs to be focused at the top of the pyramid, if you will, not at the poor farmer. It needs to be focused at the at interdiction of the convoys, the processing, the labs, as opposed to the, uh, the Afghan farmer who is either forced to by poverty or forced to by the threat of being killed by, um, by the, the Taliban. If you remember that map that showed the, the last map, it, it, in fact, it's in the back of your testimony, um, my testimony, but it had big brown circles and they were generally in the same area where that extreme risk uh, existed. Those brown circles are where opium is grown and processed and that's the linkage. There it is. All of that whole salmon area is extreme risk because the Taliban is either there on a permanent basis or can, can get there whenever it wants. And the brown circles are where the, the narcotics exist. When you say Taliban, I, I think we might use that a little loosely. We're not just talking yes. Taliban. We're talking insurgents and warlords exactly. and drug dealers, it, yes. some of whom the Taliban hook up with because it's a way to get income and some who, who don't. Precisely. Uh, and I think it does little to no good for the general populace in terms of their morale and belief in their government when they drive down the street and see a mansion owned by a, a, a drug baron uh, next to the slums where, where they're living on that. Uh, and when you buy a police chief's job for $100,000 uh, to get paid $200 a month because you know you can make up the difference in graft and corruption. Uh, and, and one other point is we met with the Minister of Commerce who indicated that if you take pomegranates from one area in the south and you try to drive it uh, through the country and out the other side, it may cost you as much as $485. You can stop 27 times, 27 times by warlords, local villages, police in a municipal area, on that basis, it is less costly to send a container of pomegranates from there to California <laughs> on that. I mean, so the problems are, are huge and, and I think we have to address how we're going to do that. If I could just uh, we'll talk a second about the uh, Focus District Development Plan, which is the latest in uh, the Combined Security Transi uh, Transition Command Afghanistan, C Sticker's approach on that is to take uh, a community, a district, take all the police out that the community is upset because they're corrupt and bring them over to the academy for training, replacing them with the uh, Afghan National uh, Corps, which is already highly trained and more well trained than the regular right. police. And for an eight week period that goes on, then you bring back uh, the trained unit from the local area, ostensibly with some mentors and, and other people on that, but not always. If we do that on the pace they're at right now, it would probably take us 15 to 20 years to get all the districts in this country developed. I mean, I think it's, a, it's an interesting idea, but it's hard to see how that's going to solve the problem on that, particularly when we had reports of up to 40 percent attrition in some rates. You get them all trained up and 40 percent of the people drop off somewhere on that. I'd just like to hear the comments that people might have about what they see as the future of that particular program. Uh, and am I right in my assessment? It could take us forever to get to a point where you get it. They're already going back to retrain some of the six that they did. Um, I guess my view is at this point, that's the best we got. We don't have enough of them and we don't, we don't train them for a long enough period of time. In other words, I would much rather see those, those uh, units going out and being trained for four to seven months and then coming back and keep the ANCOP there, build up more ANCOP to do that. Um, but you're going to need more training centers. We now have, I think, six. Uh, regional training centers. You're going to need more of those. You're going to need more uh, trainers and mentors. A substantial number more. The question is, is how serious do we believe this links up to the ability to confront the insurgency? 
And if we think it's crucial to have an effective police force to do that, then we have to commit the resources. I mean, there's no other way. This can't be done on the cheap. And the, the, the effort at the auxiliary police, 10 days training, here's a gun, uh, that was a disaster. And now the, the new um, idea uh, of uh, taking um, in the Pashtun area, taking militias, providing them with weapons, giving them a, a, uh, a substantial amount of authority, uh, but not not within the command structure of the of the Afghan. I want National to explore Police. that a little bit more with you, but I want to give Mr. Flake an opportunity to ask questions as well. Uh, Mr. Johnson, for, for the record, again, we we know the controls aren't there. The recommendations have been made. There's some um, evidence that those are being implemented already, and we'll see. Uh, and and I'd like to to. Uh, I believe we're going back in March, is it? Uh, it would be nice for our committee to be made aware of uh, any analysis you have after that time. Uh, but uh, right now we have no hard evidence that these, are, these weapons are ending up in the hands of the Taliban. Um, we, we haven't had our forces go out and uh, do a raid and, and find our own weapons being used by the Taliban. Is that correct? We have no first-hand accounts on our own, uh, and nor have we seen any Def Department of Defense-specific uh, military forces reporting that. But, however, some of the contractors who are working on behalf of the U.S. government have uh, reported in some of their assessment reports that they have allegations of theft and uh, rep uh, reports of the enemy actually receiving some of the weapons. Okay. Uh, but we haven't seen evidence yet that they've been used against our forces? No, sir. We have not. Okay. Um, Back to uh, when, I, when I finished uh, my first round, I, I asked what remedies there are. Obviously, with our own uh, controls that we put in, we can enforce those and make sure that no additional weapons are given out unless there are proper controls there. Uh, but with when you're dealing with uh, partners that uh, may not come through, but you have to rely on, there's no other choice. What kind of remedies can we have to ensure that the Afghans uh, maintain or cooperate and, and implement their side of the controls that they need to? Uh, what can we do to ensure that that happens, realizing that we can't simply say we're just not going to deal with the Afghan forces anymore? They have to be equipped. They're certainly not uh, useful if they're not. Uh, what what can we do there? Yeah, I, I think one control we can put in place is the routine monitoring of the weapons that are being provided um, routinely uh, as we go out to some of the units checking. Since we do have mentors who are embedded within with the units to check on the weapons and to maybe do random um, inventory checks. Are those uh, those recommendations were made as well? Then? That is, uh, for, from what I believe, a part of what they're. Going, their plans in the future may be uh, okay. to include some of that in there. Okay. We've actually made those recommendations. I'm sorry. You I said we've actually made those you've recommendations. You've made those recommendations. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, Mr. Schneider, um, you, you mentioned with, uh, uh, and unless we get a hold of the poppy production and, and, uh, and deal with that, do you see evidence uh, with the recent kind of change in focus by NATO forces uh, allowing them to to involve themselves more closely. Uh, do you see that uh, as, as, as helping at this point yet, or just the potential that it might uh, be of help down the road? I think that if it's implemented, it will clearly be of help. Um, this is something that we called for. I, I went to Afghanistan in 2003 the first time, and uh, at that time uh, no one, neither NATO nor the United States forces, were willing to do anything about the uh, the opium poppy um, trafficking. If they found it on the road, they'd let it go. Um, and I think that now the, the, um, the, this new order, which permits them to go after the processing centers and the labs if, at the request of the Afghan government, uh, is quite positive. I, if you begin to place some additional risk there uh, into the system and at the same time provide the farmers some alternatives right. in terms of credit for licit crop production and, and, and the access to services, you, you begin to get a, have a chance um, at dealing with the problem. And if you begin to deal with corrupt officials, 
uh, at the top level. It's interesting you, you mentioned that uh, there didn't seem to be the, the focus early on in 2003. I visited Afghanistan for the first time, I think it was 2003, or just after Karzai was, was uh, put in place. And he mentioned, I went back to my notes when we met him this last time, just uh, two months ago. I went back to my first notes, and he said the, the, the biggest battle we have is, is on poppies. And that's, uh, he called it the mother of all battles. Uh, this time, I, I saw a decidedly less uh, committed uh, approach and, and denial, it seemed, that, that uh, poppy production was, was uh, actually aiding the enemy. Mm -hmm. um, or financing terrorism. He, he, in fact, claimed that it wasn't. And there were some people who said, well, that's because he's unwilling to follow up on corruption charges with family members and everything else. But, but you see it differently. You see, do you see the, the Afghans themselves or just more of a focus of our efforts? Uh, are the Afghans following up in that regard or not? Um, at this point, it, it's very hard to see Except for the naming of the Minister of Interior and the new Attorney General, uh, those are positive steps because the Minister of the Interior was, was even though it was responsible for police, it in fact was a place where there was significant amount of corruption and linkage to drug trafficking. Um, I'm hopeful that that means that there's a willingness on the part of the Afghan government to take serious action. Without that, you can throw money at the problem and, and it's not going to work. You've got to demonstrate that there's political will at the top to go after drug traffickers. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Schneider, let me just uh, ask a couple of final questions here. The, the European Union is supposed to be, I say supposed to be, uh, deeply involved in this training of police and the law and uh, order justice uh, situation on that and have been missing in action largely on that. Uh, they've got a new representative there as well. They're doubling the size of, uh, of their right. commitment to the uh, international aspect on that. Do you see any hope in that, or is that all mirrors and smoke? No, no. I mean, I think that, that they, together with, uh, with NATO, um, I think recognize now that the creating a functioning effective police force is part of, an essential part of the security problem in Afghanistan. And so I'm hopeful that that as you note, those initial actions will be followed by uh, substantial new contributions of trainers. Uh, they also, remember, as I said, I, I had the numbers on the U.S., but we know in Europe there are substantial numbers of, of civilian police available. They put hundreds of police into the Balkans in the aftermath of uh, the conflict there. So much more can be done, and I hope it will be. And, and lastly, let me just ask about, you mentioned briefly, and I, I want to just explore that a little bit, this new concept that uh, we've heard that it seems that C-Sticker in, in the United States may at least be tacitly allowing to go forward, if not fully endorsing, and that is to have local shura or local council nominate uh, young men from their village uh, to be a security uh, force of sorts who would then get vetted ostensibly by the, uh, the Afghanis and by our forces or whatever to check and see the best they can if they have any record of involvement with uh, insurgents or whatever and then they would uh, be involved for security while the police would be involved for policing within that. Uh, will you tell us about some of the inherent risk in that and your assessment of whether or not that's a good way to move forward? Well, and we see three risks. Um, the first, obviously, is that uh, if they're paying these individuals more than the, they're paying the, the, the police, police on the beat, uh, it's going to create problems for the police. Uh, second is whatever resources you're devoting to that, are not resources you're devoting to creating an effective uh, Afghan National Police Force. Um, and finally, if they're not under the direct command of the local, of, of the Afghan National Police, you're creating the potential for a difficult situation there. But finally, nationally, if you're only arming Pashtun tribal militias, however, whatever you want to call them, uh, then you're exacerbating the north-south political divide in the country, and you're get going back to setting in motion the reverse trend of rearming local militias, and it's very hard to think that the other ethnic groups, the Tajiks and others, who have been disarmed to some degree under programs that the, the U.S. and NATO have financed, 
Uh, it seems to me very hard to uh, say, sorry, your tribes and your local communities can't do the same thing. And they're probably going to get as much money from um, their warlords as uh, we provide to them, Pashtuns. Do you have any uh, questions on Prime Minister? Okay. All right. I, uh, I want to thank uh, the ranking member, obviously, for his participation and, uh, his, and the committee members, but I want to thank our witnesses uh, most of all. You've been very helpful with your reports, your staff work on that and with your testimony here today. Uh, this is a you know, perplexing subpart of a, a much larger perplexing problem that we have uh, that is uh, international implications and some questions as to uh, what our strategy going forward is and it's going to have to encompass this aspect as well as some broader strategic aspects. I personally think that we're going nowhere unless we start including in other nations in these conversations and that includes Iran uh, and Russia and China and India and the stands. Uh, all of whom, in some instances, have more at risk than we have. Uh, a lot of these uh, acts that, that have been going on with the poppy, of course, uh, and the opium goes to mostly Europe. Uh, they have a high interest there. There's concern that some of the insurgent spreading from Taliban would, in fact, go through uh, Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan and uh, Uzbekistan, those places, and on up into Russia. So I think that we have to start uh, realizing that everybody's got a stake in this and start looking strategically in a much broader way. Uh, and also, as we do that, come down and focus on these very real and particular issues uh, and make sure that we're not arming the very insurgent that we're uh, trying to suppress on that basis. So thank you for all of your assistance. You know that we'll look forward to uh, asking for your assistance again, and we appreciate all the help you've given us. Meetings adjourned.